Hello and welcome to our third lecture for our uh, English and Women's Studies 3073 class. Uh, this one is going to be on Charlotte Temple and the Early American Literary Marketplace. And I'm going to begin this particular lecture talking a little bit about some historical background about fiction in the United States, or at least the early earlier years of the United States. Uh, even before the United States in a way, um, and give you a little context here because I don't think we want to dive into our first novel without knowing something about that because it is very important. Um, the novel as a genre arose in uh, around the, um, the, the in the Western world. Uh, some of the earlier ones were uh, Pamela uh, in uh, in Britain uh, and um, uh, Don Quixote in Spain and many others in the uh, late 1600s. Really, when it um, that's that's when it really starts getting going. Um, novels like. Robinson Crusoe that you may have heard of, Maul Flanders, other novels of that nature um, that came about at that time. But in the United States, or in America, I should say, it took about 100 years later for the novel to kind of catch on. And even then, after a, br a really relatively brief period of popularity for the novel, and we're talking here the 1780s through about 1800, like a decade or so, not very, not very long, um, it pretty much died out, as did a lot of fiction or or literature for pleasure or edification, um, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, but this particular novel was a very, very, very popular novel. In fact, it was the most popular novel written by an uh, by an American or published in America or for Americans, one would say, because uh, its author has a kind of a back and forth relationship uh, between Britain and the United States. Uh, across the Atlantic, uh, but we count it as an American novel for sure. Uh, the most popular American novel um, prior to Uncle Tom's Cabin in 1850s, right, in the 1850s. And Uncle Tom's Cabin is, by almost every measure, the most popular novel ever written by an American, especially when you scale it to the size of the population, the adult reading population of the era. This novel, however, one you've probably never heard of, was almost as popular. And um, the novel begins to get traction in the 1780s and 90s in, in the United States, um, only to fall off a cliff in terms of popularity. People just simply stopped reading American novels, didn't read as many novels. And we'll talk why that is. Let's backtrack a moment and talk about the rise of fiction in the U.S. and the influences that were, were in place. Number one, the Puritans, who dominated American culture in, in the, in the, especially in the northern colonies in the 1600s and early 1700s, were not fans of fiction. They also weren't fans of drama, only certain types of poetry. They thought, they thought novels were largely a pack of lies, right? I mean, it's not true. So if it's not true, it must be a bunch of lies, and therefore lies can't be countenanced as literature. Um, also, uh, one of the things that influenced the development of of the um, American novel is that it was a very multi-ethnic society after the Puritans. I mean, you had a lot of immigrants from Europe, from Africa, from different parts of the the, uh, the Western world in particular, and that made it kind of difficult because, as we'll see later on, uh, English was not the only language being spoken, and um, it was one where not everybody identified with the particular heroine or a hero in a particular novel. The economic li uh, limitations and the lack of publishing outlets are kind of combined with one another. And it's very important to know. One of the reasons why the American Revolution was fought, this is the two-second version, was that colonists wanted the ability to expand westward. The British did not want them to do so. They'd fought the French and Indian War. They'd reached a, what they thought were, was a fairly convenient peace with the French did not want the colonists encroaching even further um, west into Native American territory and French-held territory, and they just didn't want to deal with that. And the colonists who felt mounting pressure through immigration and population expansion to expand into those areas were not happy about being bottled up. Yes, it was taxation without uh, recommendation, uh, um, um, without representation. Yes, the Stamp Act, the Tea Party, all of this could give me liberty or give me... But, but to some extent, part of the American Revolution's rationale was that the colonists said, we just can't live within these confines. We want to grow, we want to expand. And that was because the, the available 
uh, farmland had be, had begun to be taken up, and the only place to go find new farmland is to go west into the forests and the plains and all of that sort of thing. So, there were some economic limitations, but 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 before the revolution and in the decade or two following the revolution. The population of the United States, or what would be the United States, was largely confined to the eastern seaboard. So that's one reason why literature could thrive. Literature needed, at the time anyway, cities, transportation, that sort of thing. It needed money. We'll talk about that in a moment, because that's important as well. Um, I mean, you're not going to write a novel and then send it by mule uh, across the the prairies, uh, the forests, and whatnot, to some dude out west, Billy Bob, who doesn't even have any money because he's a dirt farmer and he wants to swap chickens for everything he buys. Right? He's down at the general store. He's running a a tab, and you know he wants to swap chickens or pork bellies or or corn for flour and coffee and whatever. It was not an economy that that was a cash economy. Literature needs a cash economy. Literature needs transportation. <clears throat> Literature needs um, people who can pay as well as read. And that was a huge problem. So there were some economic limitations. Once the revolution is fought, that bottle top is taken off, the cork is out, and westward expansion can happen. And that westward expansion happened very, very rapidly. The population dispersed very far west very quickly far ahead of the ability of the rest of the eastern seaboard civilized society, if you want to call it that, to keep up with that growth. And so people were flung to the west, far, far to the west. Took a while for things like schools and roads and bridges and economic banks, money, to catch up with that population dispersion. It just spewed out all over the place. And the result of that, along with the fact that new immigrant populations, not all of whom spoke English, the Dutch, the Germans, French, many French Huguenot, lots of other people came over and they didn't speak any English. And then the people who went out west, it might have been a generation or two before their children or their children's children had formal education and were literate, right? So if you don't have literacy, if you don't have transportation, if you don't have money, as in cash, dollar bills, rather than just a barter system, then you've got a real problem if you're, if you're trying to sell novels or any other type of books. Just about the only book a lot of these frontier people had in their house was a Bible, and many people only had a very, very limited ability to be, be able to read that. From a, the period of, and now here's the other thing, if you did have if you did have a great writer, and, and you know, um, James Fenimore Cooper was a great writer during this period of time. Either he was going to sell his books in big cities on the East Coast like New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Charleston, places like that, which is fine, and he did, or he was going to have to find a way to, to publish in, in, with, with small publishing houses who were willing to take a risk on him. And that, that's a big problem. You know, the American publishing firms were small. They didn't have a lot of capital. They were family-run businesses. Wiley and Houghton and, and some of these other folks were, were, were really kind of small little publishing firms. The big publishing firms were back in England. So if you're a small business, small publishing firm, and some guy comes to you and says, hi, my name is Edgar Allan Poe. You've never heard of me, but I've got these great short stories, and I'd like you to publish them for me. You're going to say, hmm, should I take a chance on this guy? He looks like he's been drinking. Uh, should I take a chance on this guy? Looks, it looks like he's a little bit quirky. Or could I just maybe hop on a boat, go over to England, grab a couple of copies of the, of the latest books by Charles Dickens, somebody who's got a proven track record, bring them back over here and just print them. There was no copyright law. They could just lift everything and plagiarize the heck out of it. Well, it's not plagiarism, but it's just stealing, frankly. Um, and that's a much better bet. You're a small publishing firm. You can't afford to take a chance on people like that. And so it was very difficult. All those conditions, all those conditions meant that it was very, very difficult between about 1800 and 1825 or 1830 for you to get published if you were an American writer. People were reading, if they were, things from England. They weren't buying American authors' books because publishers in the United States weren't willing to take a chance on them very much. So a little guy like Hawthorne, remember him? Nathaniel Hawthorne? 
Scarlet Letter, he didn't start out really writing novels. He wrote short stories so he could publish them in magazines and get paid really quickly. They pay you about a buck a page for those. And then when he had enough of them, he put them together in a book called Twice Told Tales. They're told twice because he told them first in a magazine, in a short story, and then he collected his short stories into a collection of them, an anthology, and that's the second telling, you see, the second publishing of it. Um, so there were ways of going, but it was really hard going. All those factors and the fact that literacy rates actually declined until the end of the Jacksonian era. All these folks moving out west, all these new immigrants coming in, the, the number of people who had good quality literacy skills and could and, and also had the leisure time to read went way down. So um, between 1800 and about 1830, um, you see this big V-shaped literacy chart um, that literacy rates w really went down. William Hill Brown's The Power of Sympathy is widely considered the first American novel, and it falls in a pattern that we're going to talk about here briefly that this novel, Charlotte Temple, falls into, and that is it's called the sentimental seduction novel. Sentimental because there's a lot of crying, a lot of tears, a lot of, of, of emotion. Seduction because, well, it almost always involves a young female heroine, right, who encounters a handsome, dashing, persuasive young man, and even though her upbringing and her circumstances and her morality say that she should draw limits with this man and she should, she should not go too far with this man, most of the novel is spent with the reader who, by the way, the readers of these novels tended to be teenage girls, okay? Let's just face facts. They just were. Or their mothers who found the novels in their daughter's bedrooms and said, ah, give me that trash. I'm going to burn it. And then they went up and read it themselves, probably. Um, these young girls, characters in the novel, the whole novel is usually, there's like dozens of these things. The whole novel is you spend wondering, will she, won't she, will she, won't she, will she, won't she, and then you turn the page and, oh my gosh, they did it. Right? And you know what I mean by did it. Uh, and then the consequences, the fallout, right? Oh, no, you know what's going to happen. You know what's going to happen. She's going to get pregnant, right? And this was a huge, huge, huge no-no back in the 1700s. It just was not done, particularly for girls of means, middle class, upper middle class, higher society girls. I'm sure it happened all the time. Believe me, it did uh, with working class girls, but not with middle class girls, right? We're going to talk a little bit about class a little bit later on. But the, uh, the sentimental seduction novel was a kind of novel that allowed you, if you were like a 15, 16, 17-year-old girl, to read about what some other fictional girl did that you would never, never do, right? But you, you learned a lot about, ooh, all the scandalous things that could happen. And it was they were usually designed ostensibly to scare these girls out of doing these kinds of, oh, beware, young, young maiden. And you see this in Rosen's book a lot. You have to wonder whether they're just this is exploitation fiction, whether they really were sincerely writing these to warn young ladies or whether it was just done to titillate people. Um, I, you, you've got to draw your own conclusions, okay? Um, but certainly they sold very, very well. And lots of young women bought these, read them like crazy, loved them. And the heroine in almost every case, in almost every novel, one of two things happens after she gives birth to a child. Either A, she dies in childbirth, or B, she repents and she goes off and joins a convent and becomes a nun. I'm not kidding. This is really what happens. Now, these novels were so popular and so, gosh, I don't know, stereotypical. I mean, they just won right after, they were very cookie cutter. Then in 1850, along comes a fellow named, as I said, Nathaniel Hawthorne, who writes The Scarlet Letter. And he has a woman who has an illicit affair, and she gets pregnant, but she doesn't die in childbirth. Her name is Hester Prynne, and she doesn't give up her child, and she doesn't join a convent. In fact, she triumphs over it, and she overcomes the prejudice and the shame and the punishment of her community, and that's a twist, a big twist. So one of the reasons why The Scarlet Letter is such a popular novel, such a great novel, 
isn't because of what Mrs. Jones or Smith told you in 11th grade English, and that is it's about not getting in trouble sexually. No, it's not. The greatness of, of, of the Scarlet Letter is that Hawthorne, some 50 years later, takes this sentimental seduction novel genre and turns it on its ear and says, what, happened, what would happen if the girl didn't repent? What would happen if the girl was sorry for what she did but she kept her child, raised her child, and became a great mother and succeeded in gaining everybody's respect. <gasps> what? We can't have that. She's a sinner and adulteress. Yes, but she's also human and everybody makes mistakes. And there's the greatness of Hawthorne's novel because it's a play off of the sentimental seduction novel. But that's 1850. In, in the 1790s, when these types of novels like Charlotte Temple come out, what you have is an explosion of interest in it and then it falls off the cliff. And for two decades, you couldn't sell a novel. Yeah, James Fenimore Cooper did, but you couldn't really sell very many American novels. All of a sudden, when literacy rates come back in the 1820s, because the economy had grown enough, because people had gotten some formal schooling, after a decade or two of the literacy rate falling, suddenly this novel, yes, this one, 30 years later, becomes a bestseller again. Can you imagine pop music from 30 years ago becoming huge again, you know? Imagine Millie Vanilli having a number one hit again um, in 2019. It would be unheard of. It would be weird. But why did that happen? Because here's what happened. People all of a sudden said, hey, um, seems like book sales are up in the bookstore for novels. Novels? We haven't sold novels in years. Well, yeah, but they really want them and we're all out. What do you got? Oh, I don't know. Let's go back in the warehouse and see if we've got some old prints and some old plates and some old copies and dust them off. Oh, here's this one called Charlotte Temple. Oh, I remember when that came out. I was a kid when that came out. That was a big one. Let's print a few of these and see if anybody buys them. And sure enough, the demand was so great, it became a bestseller again. And that's how the, the, the early American literary marketplace rebounded from falling off of a cliff. And that's how a novel like Charlotte Temple, which was a raging novel, became a raging novel again after having been forgotten. And to this day, it's pretty much forgotten because it wasn't that great of a novel. It's a great novel because it shows you what people were reading. It's not a great novel because it was great literature. Now, we're going to dive into this in a second and probably third part of this lecture series, so hang in there, and our quiz will be at the end of, this, of the final video.